lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry that is miming my intro. <laughs> How's it going? I was just, I can hear the music as you're saying it. Even, oh, though, it's, even though it's not there, I still, I hear it in my head. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, cool. And, and I'm sure our listeners are doing the same thing, getting down to the music. Well, they're hearing it though. They hear it though. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I hear it too. Okay. Well, so. cool. Well, we're back on a Thursday again. Yeah. This may, Friday may become our regular day though, right? We were, we're talking about We're talking doing about maybe moving it to a little project on Thursdays. Yeah. I think that would be good. We can do do Cars Thursday and Podcast Friday. Yeah. But of course if things go wrong, it's hard to do on Saturday or Sunday. Yeah, Saturday and Sunday. Well, they're not impossible though. No. Um I mean, they're easy for enough me. for me. It's you. You're yeah, the problem. Yeah, I'm the I'm the problem. <laughs> and that, and they're like I say, they're possible those days. Mm-hmm. So um, I mean, it does kind of throw a bit, bit of a kink in things, but, uh, well, um, this week I got my flights and hotels for the, uh, Libertarian National Convention in DC this year. Oh, nice. Um, so <coughs> bunch of libertarians in DC, this sounds dangerous. Yeah. It's, uh, the theme is, I think it's become ungovernable. Yeah. I think that's the I thing. like that. That's I good. actually I preferred the one from a couple of years ago, uh, Liberty Unmasked. Yeah. That was such a great Dude, that time was, for yeah, that theme. Yeah, the, that was yeah, very very time appropriate. Yeah. Um, I mean, to what was going on in the world. But being in DC with become ungovernable or be ungovernable, whatever whatever it is. No. Um, that's not bad either. Yeah. But the point I was going to make They've had is, some really good ones because mm-hmm. I, um the year that I can't even remember the poor guy's name but um when the guy passed that had made the um I'm oh, that uh, libertarian doctor, uh, yeah 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 um I can't wait, remember Was he a doctor? Name. He was a doctor, right? I think so. Yeah. Uh gosh, I can't think of his name either. Uh, I go back and listen to that speech uh, every now and then cuz it gets me fired up every time like I'm that libertarian like I just yeah, and that was so appropriate after he had passed. Mm. Like I say, so they're pretty good at, at naming these events. I'll yeah, well, they open it up to to um, everybody to submit stuff and, to submit. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so there's some clever people in the Libertarian Party. Yeah, and the free market works. The free market finds the best. That true. You know, because like I say, they definitely have had some good ones. So. Oh, I was uh, I was reading an old speech by um, Richard Feynman, uh, who's a physicist. Yeah. Um, from 1964 he gave in Japan the other day and he was oh dang it now I can't remember exactly what it was that I what made me think of it in, in the moment trying to think oh, yeah. of his, the details about the speech and so forth made me forget what the reason that I <laughs> why it was it relevant <laughs> yeah um oh I did however pull a quote from it the the talk was about the role of the scientific community in the modern <coughs> in modern society yeah. Um and it was it was pretty interesting anyway like for the most part. He's he's kind of tough to read because he has this very idiosyncratic way of speaking. Yeah. So I, I find myself in play like grammar is not a strong suit of his. Like normal So you just kind of mentioned that not a, makes me think what it would be like to read a Trump speech. Or a speech by you. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Right. Good luck. <laughs> is all I can tell you. Uh, so anyway, I did pull a quote from the end of, from the closing paragraph. Actually, it is the the closing pair of sentences to the speech, um, which I I found really interesting. Uh, he said, and I'm going to read them now. All right. He said, and you'll you'll hear like how difficult. Maybe it doesn't sound as bad when I'm saying it as it is when, when you're trying to when I'm trying to it. read it. But yeah, he says. Uh, I believe, therefore, that although it is not the case today, that there may some day come a time, I should hope, when it will be fully appreciated that the power of government should be limited, that governments ought not to be empowered to decide the validity of scientific theories, that that is a ridiculous thing for them to try to do, that they are not to decide the various descriptions of history, or of economic theory, or of philosophy. Only in this way can the real possibilities of the future of the human race be ultimately developed." That's pretty awesome. Yeah. 
coming from a non-libertarian, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, he sounded pretty libertarian there. I mean, he did. And like I say, I'm assuming the guy's not, but maybe he is. Yeah. I don't know. Well, I mean, this was a different time, too. So he probably was a little bit more libertarian than your average, like, academic today. Yeah. Um, especially because this is, you know, this is... Well, I imagine he, he everybody on, back then was a little more libertarian. Well, yeah. The society <laughs> well, was, was a little more... The, the society was anti-communist, so pro-capitalist well, yeah. <laughs> to yeah. begin with. Uh, he's also, he, in his very early days in physics, um, he was working on the Manhattan Project. Oh, okay. Uh, so, and <laughs> there was actually a really long speech that he gave about that that I also read that was pretty interesting. Um, as well. Now he's mostly talking about some of the things that were going on behind the scenes that were just kind of silly or whatever. Yeah. Um, and his own thing about that he just didn't care who it was that he was talking to. That's been both a boon and a problem for him in his life. Yeah. So some of the some of the scientists that he interacted with were real bigwigs, and they appreciated that because other people were afraid to tell him what they really thought. Yeah. But. Feynman wasn't. Yeah, he would say, "No, that's stupid." <laughs> you know, to, to these, to like Niels Bohr and people like this. Yeah. Um, so uh, anyway, um, but he was he was talking about one when, when they actually set off the bomb the for the first time, not not when they used it, but when they actually We're tested it. it. Yeah, um, and uh, he said. That there was, you know, they had this huge party afterwards because it worked, and <laughs> all these scientists had been working on this for all this time, and yeah. they were really excited about it. And I wish I could remember who it was that he was talking about, but that he came around to one of these scientists that was kind of a bigwig in the project, and they were all morose and like, you know, not celebrating with everybody else. And he said, you know, well, what's wrong? Like it worked, and he's like, yeah, but what have we introduced into this world? Yeah. Like, and that's yeah. what you have to consider. <laughs> yeah. What happens from here? What happens when we use this on actual people? You know. Yeah. Um, it's something that's kind of hard to celebrate. Yeah. And so Feynman said, it, like, it really it shifted him at that moment that he like yeah. stopped for a moment. Like he'd been all excited about the completion of this project you know, that they'd worked so hard on, and that the, that they the success of it. And then he had <laughs> it, like it brought him back to reality about like yeah. what what, this what thing we're is. really doing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, was, it was a pretty interesting, interesting moment in the speech. Yeah. Anyway, um, so I thought about mentioning it last week, but we weren't quite there. So <coughs> good grief, man. I know I'm dying. <laughs> drink, some, drink some whiskey. That'll make it better. <laughs> you can go always, get more if you need to. Always helped me in the past. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't like to recommend, recommend violence alcohol or insanity to anyone but they've always worked for me as hunter thompson said <laughs> uh, it's something like that yeah that's that's a it's close it yeah. sounds right so uh we have pa now passed the two-year mark of the war in ukraine ah okay and so um there's a very different feeling about it now than there was two years ago it seems well i mean kind of they still want a bunch of money Oh, it, the, yeah, that hasn't changed. The Ukraine <laughs> portion of this hasn't changed as much, except that they have a whole lot fewer people out there. To fight? <laughs> yeah. Um, more weapons, fewer people, yeah. and not enough weapons still. Yeah. Because they never had a chance. Yeah. Like, it, it, was, it was a foregone conclusion. Which and is so, the reason that they should have negotiated. <laughs> yeah, and we'll, we'll spend some time on that, because there's... We've done a we've done a terrible thing there, yeah, and not just us, obviously. But um, I mean, we're the, we're the we're the most <laughs> influential party, I think. Yeah, uh, certainly in NATO, yeah, and of the collective West, whatever we're however we're defining that, we're still the most influential nation, I think. Um, and then. Like I'm not sure where to start with this. I don't know if we just start with Ukraine or if we start with some things that um, Victoria Newland gave an interview, and uh, and I I got some pushback from some of the things I said towards the end of the podcast <coughs> last week about the U.S.'s motivations in why we're in, involved militarily all over and yeah. Um, 
there were some moments where she just kind of revealed some stuff that I'm not sure she intended to. Yeah. And so I don't know if I want to play those clips now or in the middle. Yeah. Because they relate most directly to what we were talking about at the end of the last podcast. At the same time, it feels like kind of a non sequitur to just like start with it, even though it follows logically from where we ended last time. Yeah. But maybe we'll just talk about where we are in Ukraine right now and what's happened, and then we'll get to that. And I kind of... I kind of want to start with this news clip, and I can't remember where it's from, but uh, where they're talking about um, what's been accomplished in Ukraine. Okay. You want to hear it? Yeah, let's hear it, because I, right. I have some thoughts on what, what's been accomplished since this all started. Yeah, so I'm you, curious to hear what your clip is. Yeah, you might be surprised. I may be. All right, here it goes. And on this anniversary of the start of the war, it's worth stepping back and noting that neither Russia nor Ukraine has made progress on its goals, despite hundreds of thousands of casualties on both sides. Russia has failed to occupy all of Ukraine, and Ukraine has failed to retake all of the land occupied by Russian forces. Okay, well, on the bright side, it is kind of a why are we doing this type of news clip. Yeah, yeah. Um, on the other hand, it's not entirely accurate, I think. Yeah. So, um, we're, and it's a little misleading in some places too. When we talk about hundreds of thousands of casualties on both sides. Those casualties mean more to the Ukrainians than to the Russians because it's a more, more of their population, percent of their population. Right. And... There's actually quite a bit more of them, as far as I can tell. Yeah. Um, on the Ukraine side than the Russian side, anyway. I yeah. mean, we're we're probably looking at at least three to one. Yeah. And maybe five to one or more. Um, but as a conservative estimate, you could probably say that there's been like six hundred thousand Ukrainian casualties and two hundred thousand Russian casualties, something something like that. Yeah. Um, just the numbers just work that way. I mean, yeah. if, if Russia's firing five to 10 times as many artillery shells in an artillery war, yeah, the, yeah, <laughs> it, it stands to reason that they have, um, that Ukraine has incurred a lot more casualties in that case than Russia has. Yeah. Unless they're just shooting them into fields or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which wouldn't make a lot of sense. Because just obviously the Russians don't have any kind of equipment that would tell them where the Ukrainians are. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Um, but the other thing is the the idea that Russia sought to occupy all of Ukraine. Yeah. That was never their intention. No. they They wouldn't want to. I mean, they have enough sense to know how difficult it would be to occupy and hold the parts of Ukraine, the mostly northern and western parts of Ukraine, that hate the Russians. Yeah. Um, and it actually, if you'll remember, they didn't even annex the territories when the operation first began. Um, the op- when the operation first began, Russia just recognized the independence of Donetsk and Luhansk. Yeah. Uh, they didn't even they didn't even claim them as their own territory. They just recognized their independence. Yeah. And th- another thing is that w- we keep coming back to this idea that Russia planned to take Kiev inside of a week. Yeah. And they failed to do so. But you know they have enough sense to know what kind of forces they would need to capture and occupy Kiev. Yeah. And at least from the military strategists that I was reading uh, on these topics, they say that in in modern day you need between uh you need one soldier for between every 20 and 40 civilians in if to ca- to <laughs> capture and hold a territory or a city like that in the modern warfare. Yeah. Um which means that the Russians would have needed between um uh, like 80 and 150,000 soldiers to capture and occupy and hold Kiev. Yeah. But they never had more than about 40, 45,000 troops facing that direction. Yeah. And, um, so they, you know, and certainly the Russians know the logistics. Yeah. Of, like capturing a city, right? Exactly. Yeah. And, 
and there were a lot of people at the beginning that said that they they were only using their forces outside of Kiev as a fixing army to yeah. make it so that Ukraine couldn't move troops away from Kiev. They couldn't leave Kiev undefended because there was enough of a threat outside of Kiev. Yeah. So they had to keep troops there while the Russians actually did what they were trying to do in the Donbass region and then across the, <laughs> the south. Yeah. Um, or the southeast as well. Right. So they they used the troops that they had near Kiev um, as a, just like a pressure point or a threat to try and achieve a political objective. And they had just about done it in yeah. just a couple of months. I mean, yeah. negotiations started really quickly after the invasion in February 24th uh, in of 22. Yeah. And um, in March, I think it was in March that this actually happened. It seems right. Um, in March... Ukraine had agreed in those talks, um, ha had made at least a preliminary agreement to neutrality, yeah, to not joining NATO. And as a result of that preliminary agreement, the Russians withdrew their troops from Kiev, from yeah. outside of Kiev, as a show of good faith in, yeah. in this. Of course, then um, <coughs> those, those talks were scuttled by Boris Johnson, uh, at the behest of the collective West, which again, the U S would be the most influential player. Yeah. And, uh, that was the end of that. that. Yeah, that was that. And then, and Russia still never didn't, Russia didn't really mobilize. They were still doing it as a special military operation with the, the standing army that they had at the beginning of the war yeah. until roughly August. It was like about in August of 2022 when they tried again, uh, to um, to come to a diplomatic agreement. And it was at that point that Zelensky refused to talk to them at all and said that there would be no ceasefire. Yeah. And at hey, I'm getting all this money from the West. Like, why am I going to surrender now? Like, Right. Um, and it was at that point that Russia finally said, okay, well, we're going to do this for real. Then we're leaning we're, in. Yeah, yeah. we're... We're going to call up our reserves and, and start drafting people and so on. Yeah. And I, I know that people like talk about how Russia's having to conscript military men to fight in this. Yeah, yeah so is Ukraine. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> in Ukraine, fact, I saw something recently about a guy who had been maimed in the war, mm -hmm. and that's basically all he was doing was going around conscripting people. Yeah. Like literally that's like in the – I mean he took a lot of pride in it. Like that was like his thing or whatever. Um, but that's what he was doing is just kind of traveling around. Like I can't fight anymore, but I can find people to fight. And that was, that was what he's doing. Yeah. They, the reports are that the average age of the Ukrainian military at this point is over 40. That's insane. And that doesn't happen because <laughs> that's. Yeah, that happens for one reason. Yeah, the 20 reason and 30 year olds are gone. Exactly. I mean, they've either fled or they're dead. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, which is which is sad. Like, I mean, yes. that, I mean, I dude, that's horrible. Um, but it's the reality of the it's, it's the reality of the war. Yeah, and it's really unfortunate because this is this is essentially a result of the West, the collective West whatever that is, yeah. um, misunderstanding Russia's political maneuvering because yeah. the, because <laughs> I, I do really believe that the purpose of this, as far as Putin was concerned, was to get some concessions from Ukraine about neutrality. Yeah. That's always what this was about. Uh, yeah. At least until August. Yeah. And, um, they actually started to get there until, like I said, you know, Boris Johnson went over and told him, you know, forget this. Yeah. And, Putin's claimed over and over again, and there's been others that have affirmed it, including uh, members of the Ukrainian delegation to the to the uh, peace talks that said that they had a deal that was essentially like it needed detail filled in. But they had a framework of a deal that both sides had agreed on. Yeah. In a like March, April 2022, two months into the war. Yeah. Yeah. Could have had this hammered out. Now, how many people have died since then? And how much property has been lost since then? And oh, how, yeah. I mean, there's been so much destruction and so much death since then yeah. when it could have been resolved 
pretty quickly. <laughs> and like I said, there was Russia, I believe, was trying to, and I, I don't approve of this. This is no. not how you. I mean, it, it's a form of terrorism in itself. It's a use of force to achieve political goals. In fact, yeah, it's not we different make a when the government about not doing this when you join the Libertarian Party. Yeah, uh, exactly. So definitely don't uh, approve of this as the proper way of getting things done. But yeah. I, I do think that that was the goal, and there was a misunderstanding in the collective West that thought that his political maneuverings were actually a sign of a military weakness. Yeah. <clears throat> and yeah. so the the West used that to try and just pump more weapons and money into Ukraine with the idea that they would actually be able to defeat Russia, and it was a fool's <laughs> errand. Well, on top of that, I think that... Even if they knew that they weren't going to defeat Russia, that they were definitely trying to bleed them dry. Yeah, with the the loss of Ukrainians and not Americans. Yeah, like that was. I, I think that that was the goal for the West was like we're going to use this as an opportunity to to bleed Russia dry by just pumping money into this into the other side of this war. And and what's happened is is we've kind of bled ourselves dry. Yeah. Like in many ways. Well, I was listening to Scott Horton was talking to Lee something or something. Lee, I can't remember now. Um, I was listening to an interview anyway that he, uh, today, that he had, had done with a China expert. Okay. And this guy was saying that he didn't think that China was likely to invade Taiwan. He said, but honestly, now's the time. Yeah, if they were going to do it. Be- yeah, now yeah. would be the best possible time to do it. Because uh, the U.S. has spread itself thin, Mm -hmm. um, supporting the wars in Ukraine and in the Middle East. Um, They've depleted stockpiles. They, you know, they're distracted and spread thin. And And on top of all of that, like, I mean, all of that's evidence enough. We're also going into an election, which is going to make it that much more difficult for people to mobile to to mobilize things, mm-hmm. it's, it just it would make it more difficult for Congress to make a, a big action. Yeah, because they're busy on the Ex- campaign trail. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, and, and it would be that now is when, and they know this. Like now is when Americans are paying attention. Like Americans only only pay attention every four years, mm-hmm. but they're paying attention now. Yeah. Um, and like I say, if they went into Taiwan, would the American people really be like, oh, well, this is our fight. Let's go. Because we're already tired of Ukraine mm-hmm. as, as a people. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so, you know, you're ab- he's absolutely right. Like if there was a time for China to do this, now would be it. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a real reason to think that the, you know, th- from our perspective, their losses would be catastrophic. Yeah. But China has 1.3 billion people. Yeah, they can afford it. Yeah, the, I mean, <laughs> the just throwing a bunch of men at the island could they could overwhelm it with what they consider to be acceptable losses. Yeah, potentially. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they'd be mostly men. And the China's biggest uh, uh, population problem is they don't have enough women for the men. Yeah, right. We'll fix. Got two <laughs> birds with one stone here. Exactly. I don't know. <laughs> Not that I condone that, but that's, like, yeah, no, that's it's such a uh, um, cynical point of view, but but there, are but com- that is the point of view of governments generally. Well, I was fixing to say, <laughs> especially when you're talking about a communist country, like I mean, mm. like there's a person up there that's pushing all the buttons and moving all the levers of society. Yeah, you know, I mean, that's that's how they're viewing it. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, so. Um, and then there was this uh, this interview that Victoria Newland, one of our favorite people, <laughs> you, you can't see the sarcasm, I guess, um, puts scare quotes around that. One of our <laughs> favorite, favorite people. <laughs> yeah. um, so she she gave this interview, and it was mostly, oh well, you know, Congress absolutely needs to pass the bill to fund the war in Ukraine and in Gaza and uh, to support Taiwan and et et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Just a blank check for every neocon fantasy that exists. Right. Um, And, uh, oh, you know, Ukraine could do so much with that money. Like what? (laughs) Actually, she does give a list, but none of it's realistic. Yeah. Um, 
But there were some other things that she said that I, I kind of want to draw so attention to. So real quick, I, mm-hmm. so what is her position currently? Does she have she's, any government Yeah, position? yeah, she's like under secretary or something. She's in the State Department. Is she? Okay. Yeah. I just hadn't heard anything from her in a long time, and all of a sudden it's like she's creeped back out. Oh, no, she's been around, man. Has she? Absolutely, okay. yeah. I she, just haven't... She's got she's got some position in the State Department. She's actually like the number three person or something like that okay. in the State Department. Okay, I, I wasn't aware. Like yeah. I said. Um, although it might be one of these like... Um, the Undersecretary of European Affairs and blah, you know, yeah. Well, it doesn't, government it, titles could be like three lines long and yeah, and not mean you know, nothing. Yeah, you know. um, but like uh, so, but I mean, she is like she is she's definitely. I say definitely. I'm. I can't remember her exact title, but I am almost completely certain that she is in the top five people in the State Department. Okay. That's, I mean, that sounds right because she's been such a mover and shaker over the years. Yeah. And I, I think she's like number three. Okay. All right. I just um, didn't know what her position was because it just felt like I hadn't heard from her in a while. Yeah. Uh, she's She's been there. Maybe I've been good at ignoring the right... Ig- <laughs> yeah, ignore- exactly, that's exactly <laughs> it. He, yeah. Although, really, when Victoria Newland talks, you should pay attention. Yeah, yeah, because it means trouble. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, first is... Uh, Actually, I don't think this is, this actually came first in the interview, but the first thing that I want to talk about is her yeah. her talking about the economic situation in Russia. Okay. And I just found this really interesting, and I'll explain why after the clip. All right. It's also been willing to put the vast majority of its own uh, economic stimulus into the war effort. So it is starving Russia and Russians of investment in uh, education in their own future, all in service of Putin's imperial ambitions. I'm amazed at how well she expressed the problem with military spending. <laughs> right. <laughs> now apply that to the U.S. That spends a trillion dollars a year on the military, yeah. robbing the U.S. citizen of investments in education and infrastructure. and That's It works all, both ways. That All that money could be spent here on those things. Mm-hmm. Every time we have one of these big Ukraine packages, never mind like what we just spend on military in general. Right. But I think about that every time they pass one of these big packages Mm -hmm. that, you know, I mean, that's all money. Just think if we just like inserted that money into our economy. Exactly. Um, Not that I'm for that either, but it would be preferable to what we're doing. It's, It's amazing to me that you can just like sub out Russia for the United States in that statement. Yeah. Yeah, that they're willing to spend a bulk of their um, economic. Uh, wh- I forget the word she used exactly there, but you know, yeah. they, their um, economy. It's literally twenty percent of the government spending in this country. Yeah, um, and it's well <coughs> over what Russia spends. Yeah, easily five ten times what Russia spends. Even now. Well, yeah. it's, it's like five times what Russia spends now, and it's like ten times what Russia spent before the war began. Yeah. So, um, yeah, spending their, uh, you know, their economic income on their imperial ambitions <laughs> instead of on the people. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting when you mention imperial ambitions mm-hmm. because, like, we are the empire. Yeah. Like, that's what we are. Yeah, we're talking about their imperial ambitions when they're fighting on their border. Yeah, yeah. This is a world away from us. Yeah. Like, we have no interest over here whatsoever, or shouldn't, you know. Yeah, it's the same thing with China. We talk about, you know, the dangers of China. Yeah. But we're the ones in their territory. They're not on our borders. Yeah. Although, like, I have heard so many people say recently, they're importing an army into this country. (laughs) You know, so... uh, yeah. Uh, that that's a whole situation there. That's Doctor Phil right there. Yeah, yeah. like um, pushing that. It's which like that's, thirty thousand military aged Chinese have come into this country. Whatever. Like even I'm sorry. E- even inside the U.S. to begin with, uh, that that's an invasion of the U.S. with a woefully inadequate forces. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> no, but they're positioning them by our military bases. You where see. they're buying that's, farms. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like that's the argument. Like, the the better plan would be to starve us by not using those farms, <laughs> right? <laughs> oh man. 
Anyway. Some of the I, stuff that's out there is just crazy. But to hear that from Dr. Phil really threw me. <laughs> like, I was like, dude, this guy's lost it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, fear is a really powerful tool. It is. No, it absolutely is. And, and uh, it's wielded by, by our government very yeah. well. And it's election time. Now is, now is definitely the fear time. Oh, yeah. No doubt. Mm-hmm. So uh, anyway, I just thought that it was really interesting. That's like a little bit of truth slipping out there, but she's applying it to the wrong country. <laughs> she's I mean, got it, on the wrong it applies side. to Russia too, but... But it, Russia's like not could, my problem. Yeah. It, Here is my problem. Exactly. <laughs> when we're talking about the U.S. doing it, that's my money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, then there was this other tidbit of, of truth dropping that um, I found interesting in, this, in her interview. And so we'll, we'll play that one too. This is, this is really support for what I was saying at the end of the last podcast. Okay. And so here we go. As much as this is about Ukraine's ability to survive as a democratic state, it is also about the larger principles of a free and open international order that benefits the United States. Okay, and maybe I should have left this part of the clip in, but she actually follows that up with a, a, a domino theory type argument about how if we don't stand up to Putin here in Ukraine, that all these other dictators all over the world are just going to take over everything. They're, you know, We're not going to be able to stop the North Koreans from taking South Korea, which, of course, the South Koreans themselves can stop that. And yeah, right. you know, China will take Taiwan, and Iran will take Iraq, I guess, or I, who knows. Anyway, I mean, yeah. she doesn't go into specifics, but that's... Yeah. The argument she but, makes is that the, all these other dictators all over the world will take a cue from Putin if we don't stop Putin and do their own thing. Yeah, but the which the main, is which is fear again, by the way. Oh, like yeah. that's 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 all that is is trying to drum up that fear. Yeah. Well, and it turned out not to be true when we were talking about the Soviet Union back in the day doing that too. So yeah. it, it doesn't have a, a good historical record that domino theory doesn't really work. Yeah. Uh, or at least there's not there's not good data to support it at this point. <laughs> there you go. In fact, it would be contrary. So, but the the part that I wanted to focus on was the bit where she says, you know, maintaining the um, free and open international order that benefits the United States. Yeah. Now, the part that she leaves out about that is that the free and open international order that benefits the United States it benefits the United States at the expense of some other places. Yeah. And I think that it's perfectly ge- legitimate for those other places that it's working at the expense of to do what they can to limit that. To mitigate that. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I mean, we certainly would feel it was within our rights if there was some other international order that was, uh, um, uh, you know, hamstringing the United States Yeah. to do what we could to change the way the order was working. Yeah. The, we have this idea that um, we're the big dog. Yeah. And so everybody else needs to do it our way or get out of the way. Yeah. And we're not concerned about anybody else's concerns yeah. because we're the big dog. And this is the thing that I keep saying about Russia, which is the, the reason that this war started as much as anything is that Russia has real legitimate security concerns. Yeah. And we told them they could shove it. <laughs> All right. But in just the same way that we have uh, good reason to defend our own security concerns, so do they. Yeah. Especially on their border. <laughs> Especially on their border. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. They have a, a far more legitimate claim to um, exercising uh, actions to uh, defend their own security concerns on their border than we have to do that on their border. Yeah. Exactly. So... Um, this is the thing that I, I I want Americans to understand. It's not it, it's not that I'm like I am absolutely a patriot. It's yeah. not that I'm opposed to America doing what it can for itself, but America has to recognize that other nations have needs, wants, desires, and concerns as well. And if you really want to be the powerful free nation, you have to consider those as, as well. No, absolutely. You you you, you can't do everything at that you want at the expense of others and feel that that's a moral position. Yeah. You know, you have to be concerned. Like if you're going to be the free country and you're for the, you know, the full and natural rights of one and all, you have to consider them when you take your own actions too. 
Yeah. That they have things that they need and want too. Yeah. And you can't just have it your way all the time or you're the bully. Yeah. Which you, is exactly what we are right now. Mm-hmm. And have been for decades. Yeah. Since the fall of the Soviet Union. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, we saw the unipolar moment. Um, there were some people that recognized the unipolar moment for what it was, that it would be a temporary thing, but this is our moment to really expand our influence around the world. And there are a bunch of others that said, yeah, it's not going to be just a moment. We're going to do everything in our power to make sure that we are always permanent, the, the unipolar power. Yeah. And that's what we seem to be doing. That's the neocon position that we will maintain that power and we will take down anybody that starts to rise up. Yeah. Which is which is just insane because that mm-hmm. never it never works out well. Yeah. I mean, ask the Romans. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, well, I mean that's well. It, it's, it's funny you mentioned that. Bringing this into the like immigration thing. Of course, one of the proposals was um, that we, because we have a real shortfall in military recruitment. Yeah. Uh, one of the proposals was that that was the path to citizenship for uh, immigrants. Is yeah. you serve your time in the U.S. military um, as a non-citizen, and you'll get your citizenship afterwards. Yeah, yeah. The Romans did that too. It did not work out well. For them. Oh, really? That was the end of the empire right there. When the military, when the Roman military was uh, almost not, entirely populated with by not Romans. Romans. Yeah, yeah. I mean that. I can see how that could be a problem. Yeah. <laughs> Especially in a medieval style military. Yeah. So we what well, classical? That, that's pre medieval. Classic. Okay. Classical. All right. Well, um, even worse. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, we're. It's like we can't learn any lessons from history here. It seems. Yeah. Um, so that's that's interesting. Now uh, let's change topics. Sure. That's enough, Ukraine. And and immigration. And well, yeah, I wouldn't. I had no intentions <laughs> of talking about immigration. This was supposed to be a two-topic night, really. Okay, all right. Um, so the other one is that uh, our state has gotten a lot of attention in oh, the last yes. week because of a Sur- uh, Alabama Supreme Court decision um, about uh, in vitro fertilization. the The case was essentially that somebody was moving embryos and dropped them and. Broke them. I don't know yeah. what so the right that, word would that be. That backstory is important, by the way, because yeah. that has not been covered at all. Oh, really? Okay. Like not on mainstream. Like at least not that I've seen. Like mm-hmm. I, I heard some coverage on the, of it on No Agenda um, from Adam Curry. Okay, but that was all I had heard of that. Huh. So it's kind of important to do that little prepper with this. All right. Well, I read it, and I was reading. Um, I read a series of articles from NBC News. Okay. Um, about this. So. Okay, that's that's interesting. Uh, well, maybe it's one of those things again. Like, if you really want to know the news, you need you to, read to read it. it not, yeah. <laughs> you you really do because if you're watching the news, you're not getting the news. Yeah, there's not a you're lot. Of, not. There's not a lot of information in in video news. Yeah. Um, but anyway, okay. So <laughs> the uh, the opinion was that the that they were liable for damages, which yeah. is fine in and of itself. But yeah. the problem was. Um, it created a, a liability under the Wrongful Death Act. Yeah, and implying, not as a property act. Yeah, implying that the frozen fetus is a person. Yeah. Which could have wide-ranging repercussions. So what in the world are my know, cats doing? I don't know, but that doing? sounded rough, dude. <laughs> like, I, I hope they're just playing with each other. Well, anyway. I hope you have um, a room left that there. So it is important to note, though, that the decision didn't doesn't, seem to create a criminal liability. Yeah. So it's not like a murder. Yeah. Um, it creates a civil liability under the wrongful death act. Yeah. It's still kind of, but yeah, the problem still remains that if you're, uh, you're creating a liability as a wrongful death. Yeah. It means that fetus is a person or that embryo is a person. Yeah. And that could, that, that kind of, um, court decision could be applied wider. All yeah. right, so it has some immediate consequences. Uh, it increases liability for the businesses that are engaged in IVF, in vitro fertilization. Yeah. Um, and is likely to raise their insurance costs probably significantly. Yeah. Well, I know temporarily, at least, a lot of these places have quit providing those services. Yes, there were there were a bunch of uh, reproductive businesses, reproduction, reproductive, reproductive health 
businesses yes. um, in Alabama that just shuttered. Yeah, yeah. They're like, yeah, we can't, we can't risk We're the liability. We're not going to take on, on the this. liability of this. Yeah. Um, now, one of the responses to that was that legislators uh, scrambled. Yeah. To um, create a bill to give IVF providers immunity. Yeah. And it's, I, I think that they've actually passed at this point identical bills on both sides, uh, both sides of the legislature in Alabama, and it's it just Waiting needs to be signed by Ivy. And she yeah. that she's already said that she Expressed would sign that legislation. Expressed that she signed it, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I think they kind of realize that, they've ste- that the state has stepped in it here. Well, the, the courts have stepped in it. Yeah, but the problem with the legislation is it just kind of sidesteps the issue. Okay. It just creates... It just creates immunity from liability for the providers. It doesn't actually address the problem of making the of frozen embryo yeah. a person. Yeah. Uh, so, of course, like some of the concerns on this is that in, in vitro fertilization, um, they generally create several embryos. Yeah. Um, they test them for genetic abnorma- abnormalities and they usually dispose of the, uh, embryos that have genetic abnormalities. Um, once the, once it's taken effect, once they actually have, uh, are able to successfully implant a embryo and it grows to term and so on, they're often embryos that are left over. Um, if you can be held liable, for wrongful for death. Hurting those. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What does that mean for the for the excess, I guess you would say, embryos? Yeah. Like can you get rid of them then at that point? Like I guess you can't because it would be considered a wrongful death. Yeah. Um I do think Gotta that this leave should... them out and let them die of natural causes. <laughs> yeah. So let them unfreeze. Yeah. <laughs> uh, terrible. Um there I, I think that there are better ways to handle this. Uh, dealing with it more of as a property crime, although that makes its own statement, doesn't yeah. it? Um, the way I would handle it, I, I, I've been thinking about this quite a bit. I, I think that the best way to handle it, because I don't like this this answer. That Where the court, we are, yeah. yeah. I, I don't like I don't like what the court did, and I don't like the legislation. Yeah. Legislation is incomplete. It sidesteps the problem. The court created. Um, a, a, a series of problems that were unnecessary. Well, it just seems like to me, and I, maybe I'm not seeing where the flaw is here, but it just seems to me this should be a property issue that, that they should just, whenever something, whenever there's a liability there, it should be held under like a property issue. Yeah. But then, and then define the value. And are you saying an embryo a fetus is just property for uh, a person to dispose of as they see fit? See, that's the problem with that side of it. It is. No, like, I, you're I, running I do into get the that. abortion issues no matter what. Yeah. If if you're defining it this way. Yeah. I think the way they could have sidestepped that whole thing, the yeah. way the court could have dealt with it without yeah. making a statement <coughs> that affects abortion laws in this state, which are already already jacked up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is to deal with it as a contract law issue. Okay. That you create, you've created a contract with this uh, company to handle the fertilization. Sure. They were yeah. unable to complete their side of the contract through some kind of mistake or negligence or whatever, and yeah. deal with it as a contract law problem. No, I actually think you're right. I think that's the. I mean, they, the courts could have saved us a lot of headache here. Yeah, if they had been as smart as Michael. <laughs> well, I don't. I mean, I'm not a. I'm not an attorney, so I don't know if yeah. that works. I, I like. I don't understand enough about how the case was brought to the Supreme Court for that to know if that was if even that a, was a way that they could have addressed it. Yeah. Um. But to me, that seems like the most, um, the the least damaging way to address the question. Yeah. No, I I wholeheartedly agree. I think that's that is the way to go. And and also kind of the least permanent way. Of addressing yeah. the question. Well, but then it would lay some groundwork for what these organizations would need to do going forward. Yes. Because I think that's, that to me, that would be the most important thing is, okay, well, this mm-hmm. happened and we need to settle it. 
but we need to make sure it doesn't also happen in the future. Yeah. And by making it a contract thing, then that just tells all of these agencies, well, hey, we've got to start drawing up contracts, and mm-hmm. this is how, if something happens, this is where the liabilities are. Yeah. And it just, it streamlines things so much better. And it still would affect insurance prices and so forth it for will. these organizations. Yeah. There's no way around that. But um, it, it doesn't in the same way. So... Either addressing it, I think, as uh, addressing it as property um, or addressing it as a life uh, creates some issues with the abortion question. Yeah. No, it's Um, true. Addressing it as a life also creates issue of criminal questions. Yeah. Well, exactly. Um, So, yeah, like I said, dealing with it just as a contract question, I think, is is just the least damaging way. No, it makes resolving the makes problem. a lot of sense. Um, and and there is, I mean, there's no reason. Okay, a a couple that has lost embryos in this way, yeah, that the contract couldn't be completed because of the loss. Yeah, they they should expect some kind of recompense. Yeah, I mean they're entitled. I mean they should be. Yeah. yeah. Um. So I, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm sure that I'm sure it's a lot more complicated than. Yeah, but I, I mean, there's I mean, a lot of moving parts in this, but that it just seems to me like as I was thinking about like how how could I how do you unravel this? Yeah, what would be the best way if I were sitting in there with a, like a you know a blank slate? Like how would I address this without creating by creating as few problems as I could yeah. while still addressing the issue of. Um, uh, of making of justice. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and so that's what I thought about as contract law. Yeah, no, makes a lot of sense. And this as libertarians, you know, we're pretty big on contracts. Yeah. Contracts are important. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that goes back to the talk last week. Also, of, um, this is the proper, this would be the proper application of government to contracts. Yeah. Is that somebody lost something. Yeah. That a contract wasn't able to be completed because of, the loss. Yeah. This is where government is supposed to step in and um, and create uh, remuneration for the party that lost something. Not yeah. like what happened in New York where they step in <laughs> because they don't like the terms even though all the parties to the agreement are satisfied. Exactly. <laughs> so. so that, yeah, uh, that's all I Contracts have are important. <laughs> that's all I have on that. Um, I do have a, a, a topic that actually this did come from no agenda cause I wasn't even aware of this, although I guess I probably should have been, I mean, I, sp- I suppose I had some kind of like tangential, um, knowledge, uh, that this kind of thing was going on, but I hadn't really thought about it until, did you, uh, catch up with no agenda through Sunday where they had the whole section on kid fluencers? No, I've, I've hadn't like got that far yet. Child influencers. You were telling me um, about it, but I haven't gotten the chance to to get that far into the episode. Well, this is what I've decided to do on that. I, I don't think I want to address it right now um, because I think what I'm going to try and do is I'm, I'm going to um, I'm going to try and call Dr. Miller and see if she'd be interested in having this conversation, in reappearing with you. and talking about that. Yeah, um, it wouldn't be an interview in the same way as the last one was. It would be more of a conversation, I think. Yeah. Um, but I, I would be interested in her insight on that because um, when I first met her, we actually spent a, a, a fair bit of time talking about um, the psychological uh, effects of social media and so forth. So I think that she, I think that she would be really interesting on that topic. Yeah, there's a lot going on on that topic right now. Um, I think I saw yesterday that Florida's passed a law. Uh, that affects um, teenagers and um, social media. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's a, something Michigan going, or somewhere up in the northern Midwest also was, was, was doing something. Maybe it was Ohio even. I don't remember. Yeah. Um, I, I saw, thing, yeah, right? I saw a news flash about it. I read the, uh, the New York Times article that came out about a week ago. Yeah. It was kind of horrific. Oh, yeah. Oh, just, <laughs> yeah. I mean, and I understand the draw of parents to this thing. Like there's a lot of money to be made yeah. and I'm terrified of this society that we live in where it's something like a third of, uh, zoomers or whatever. Um, they're, um, 
in, uh, I guess their occupational goal is to be an influencer. Yeah. I, <laughs> I'm just, I don't know. I, uh, I it, mean, I, I understand the appeal of it. It's like when I was growing up that I wanted to be a professional, you know, basketball player or whatever. Yeah. Um, baseball <laughs> kids, player, kids then basketball players. Different role models these days. I guess so. It's a little frightening that the, the that, role that model is, is sitting the... behind a camera at their house instead of going outside and doing something, but whatever. Well. <laughs> I mean, at least I was out in my front yard shooting baskets all day long instead of sitting behind my computer all day. Yeah. Uh, Studying the internet. The my my biggest concern about it is the just the general concerns. I mean, we we did an episode on um, social media's impacts and uh, you know the um, application of uh, of operant conditioning in um, social media to you know give you the feel goods and and create an addictive type response and and so forth. Um, but my my biggest concern about that kind of thing. Uh, as a career and especially being introduced to it really young is just the, uh, I guess it's like your, your self image is completely based on external things. Yeah. You know, that, that your self image is, is, is based on other people's opinion of you instead of your own. Yeah. And I, I see that as being very dangerous. Yeah. And oh. leading to like some real serious issues with like depression and stuff like that. Yeah. So, um, or narcissism or I, I don't know. This is yeah. why it would be interesting to talk to Dr. Miller about it. I, yeah. uh, I think that, that that could be fun. So I'm going to try and arrange that before we, before we really dig into it on the podcast. And if I can't arrange that, then we'll, we'll <laughs> dig into it on the podcast and <laughs> yeah. do what we can. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I think we've managed another, like, not unreasonably long episode if we want to just wrap up. Yeah, I don't have anything else. So. Cool. Well, then, um, as always, you can follow us on Facebook and you can subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, Podbean. Uh, like and share, comment, subscribe. Um, you can leave reviews, uh, criticisms, whatever. Um, and you can always email me, michael at the liberty mike.com. Is that all the stuff? That seems like all the stuff. That feels like all the stuff. Yeah. So, uh, we, um, we'll be back here next week. And, uh, yeah, when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later.